All right, folks, it is 7 o'clock, a little bit thereafter. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. I, I really do appreciate everyone being here and appreciate the conversations that's happening. We're going to go ahead and get started in class. I, I tend to find myself, as we go through our class, uh, being uh, taxed for time because I want to present a lot of material. I want us to discuss things, and I've, I have learned myself well enough to know that I don't leave enough opportunities for comments on things that we're just plowing through scripture and points. And I want to try and change that as we go through this class because the purpose of this class is to help train us. It's to show us the need for evangelism and then also help us to get through evangelism. Uh, I found a book earlier today that I, um, I'm actually pretty excited. It's called Go Ye Means Go Me. And in this book, there are practical examples of real Bible studies scripts exactly what I want to do up here in the last five weeks of our class here. And so I talked with Sarah Martinson last week. Um, you know, she is our script writer for the VBS. All the skits of VBS come through Sarah. And so I'm going to get with Sarah and uh, have a brainstorming session. And we're going to try and create the scripts uh, for the last five weeks of this class. And the plan is for us to see, I'm sorry, it was four weeks the last four weeks of this class is supposed to be conducting a Bible study, getting into a Bible study the first week. The next two weeks is dedicated to inside the Bible study. And then the last class scheduled for this class is landing the plane, the closing part of a Bible study. And so for our last four weeks, which must maybe plus or minus four weeks, I don't know, but our last four classes are going to be uh, dealing with practical things. And this book, like I said, already gives us a script, a starting point. And so um, I'm excited about that. I have spoke to a few of you, uh, and I still need some more volunteers, people to uh, read along with us when we go through the, the practical side. There's not a lot of acting. You're not going to get scored or graded, or there's no trophies. I'm sorry. But... Uh, I just need different folks to fill in different roles, to participate in this mock uh, interview. And like I said, you can read it straight from a piece of paper. The, the purpose is for us to get us into situations inside a Bible study and then see how, uh, how the, the conductor of the Bible study reacted, how they moved forward, and then we'll stop. And everybody can go take their seats and we're gonna dissect what happened. We'll go over it together as a class what happened during that Bible study? Where did the speaker uh, veer off and chase a rabbit? Or where did the student have that aha moment? We're going to target those kind of things. I want to talk about those things. We're already a week behind. Uh, today we were supposed to start There is a God, and uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to continue on last week's study. We talked about the urgency of evangelism. Now I want you all to know... There is, uh, there's a lot more that we could talk about. And I'm going to try really hard to, like I said, give us all opportunity to make comments, to discuss certain things. We had a good comment last week. I've, I've got some notes on it uh, that, I'll, that we can cover, hopefully, at the end of today's class. But um, I do want to pick up where we left off last week. And then the plan is going next week we'll go to God, that there is a God. And someone asked me about the format of the class. What are these first weeks for? And I said, the first few weeks are to reinforce your faith. Because if your faith is weak, if your faith is not where it ought to be, if your faith is struggling, how can you go teach someone to have similar faith to you? Do you really want to put that on someone else? And so my, uh, my job, what I want us to do over the next number of weeks is to reinforce your faith to try and make you a stronger Christian so that way you can feel confident as we go through and, and develop into Bible studies. Before we begin, uh, I want to encourage you again, please mark it on your calendars, October the 5th. We're doing our door knocking day here. The, the deacons over evangelism have come up with some good ideas, things that we want to do. Everyone is invited at 8.30 in the morning to come and have breakfast We'd really like to have everybody be part of breakfast. Even if you can't uh, get out and walk on the streets, it's, it's going to be a lot of walking that afternoon. I think we've got planned between uh, two and three hours of walking. And so come and have breakfast with us at 8.30. Come and pray with us at 
And if you can't go with us, bid us Godspeed. Get, send us out the door uh, feeling good so that way we, those that are walking uh, are encouraged and uplifted. So if you can, make arrangements. Write it on your calendars, October the 5th, 8.30 in the morning. And if you care to uh, help to cook or prepare food for that breakfast that morning, please uh, come see one of the deacons and, and uh, we'll get out assignments. And it's, I love breakfast. It's my, it's my first favorite meal of the day, you know. All right, let's have a prayer and then we'll get straight into our class. Please pray with me. Our God in heaven, Father, we're so grateful for uh, this opportunity this evening to come together to study from thy word. Father, we're grateful for this avenue of prayer that we have where we can approach thy throne of grace, where we can uh, offer our, our praise unto thee, offer thee glory, Father, and cast our cares upon thee to bring our concerns, our hearts, troubles, our struggles. Pray, Father, that thou would be with us through this hour of study. Pray that that would help our faith to be strong. We know, Father, that uh, when we uh, open ourselves unto thee, that that will be with us. And, Father, as we go through this study, the future studies, as we look forward to our door-knocking day and on throughout the rest of the work and labors that we do as, as thy children, Father, we pray that that would be with us. Give us strength. Father, we're thankful for um, the evening that's set aside here where we can study and Father, we pray as we continue on in this study over the urgency of evangelism that we would truly understand what thy word has to say, that this would be things that are written on our hearts. These would be things that we're dwelling on constantly. Father, we understand that uh, it is thy timeline for all things, and we pray that that would help us to submit to these timelines, to not strive against thee, and Father, certainly not uh, delay until it is forever too late. Father, we pray that would be with this membership here tonight, those that have come to hear from thy word, to study, show compassion and care for thee. And Father, those that have come to encourage uh, one another, to, to uh, offer that hand of help, Father, as we strive the rest of this week. We pray that we would leave here refreshed tonight, determined uh, to be a stronger Christian tomorrow and our days forward than we have in the past. Father, we pray for uh, hurting families at this time, those that are suffering with, with pain and with loss. Father, we pray that thou would uh, ease these burdens, help us, Father, to be encouraging to one another, that we can uplift one another. Father, please bless the efforts of this congregation for the many different works that are going on, uh, for, for the things that are upcoming. We understand, Father, towards the end of the year, our congregation gets very busy we pray that that would help us to uh, stay faithful, to, to not lose patience, that we can uh, maintain our fellowship well, and that we can accomplish much together. Father, we're indeed thankful for uh, the series that's going on, for the other classes that are being taught tonight, for the souls that are here in this building that uh, are thine. Pray, Father, that that would continue to bless each one. Father, forgive us our sins, help us to cleanse our minds, be prepared for tonight's study. And we pray all these things in Christ's dear name. Amen. So last week we started out and I asked the question. I said, if something's important to you, how long would you look for it? And we brought up a few examples. And we said, you know, if you lost a dog, if you lost a cat, or a, uh, I talked about Lindy's toy that she lost for like the hundredth time that day. It's interesting, you know, I... I sometimes walk across my house. It's weird, I know. I walk through my house, and I'll smash something to pieces just because I'm walking through the house. And there's a kid that is now crumpled in a pile on the floor because that precious thing is, is now gone. And my thought is, why is it in the walking lane then? There's only so many walking lanes in the house. It's called the hallway. You know, it's like a dedicated area of the walking way, but anyway, something's precious to you afterwards, after it's gone. So imagine evangelism and how would you feel? Imagine how you would feel afterwards. You know, there's a song, and I don't even remember the title of it, but the, the premise of the song is like, why didn't you tell me about him? Oof. That's a, that's a hard song to, to really contemplate. Why didn't you tell me about him? 
And on Judgment Day, when we stand in that line, if, it's, if it is a line, I have no idea. But when we wait for the books to be opened, the, the, the accounts to be read, and you see someone you recognize that, I didn't tell that person about the gospel, and their account is read, how are you going to feel? These are hypothetical questions, and I, and I know it's not fair. It's not fair to you all to ask those kind of questions. It's really not fair. That is not a fair question to ask. But it, it emphasizes and it gets us thinking about the importance of those lost things. How important are lost things? Because when the cards are laid out, when the books are open and read, that's it. If they were lost, they will stay lost. Our second point that we went over last week, which is, is, is hard, but those that are lost tend to not know that they are lost. Uh, I've, I've thought a lot about, you know, as, as age, is, age is coming along and, and all the ailments that come with age and, you know, um, I just think a lot about uh, you know, people, for example, that have like dementia that are, that are losing their cognitive abilities, they're usually the last ones to find out. And it's unfortunate. The lost is nearly in the same boat. They're lost and they don't even know it. And so we went over some scriptures last week. We talked about uh, Matthew chapter 10. We read the, the limited commission where Jesus' specific instructions to the disciples or to the apostles at this time was to go and seek the lost sheep of Israel in Matthew chapter 10 in verse number 6. And then he warns them in verse 16. He says, you I send out as sheep among wolves. People aren't going to take it well when you tell them that they're lost. It's not going to be a pleasant experience for some. We talked about that instinctive drowning response, which is when someone is drowning, when someone is dying, and you want to come save them, and oftentimes uh, that person ends up drowning the rescuer. It's the fight-or-flight methodology where they will attack someone trying to help them. It's just its a terrible thing, and... Uh, the worst part is, it, by the definition, it says um, the suppression of rational behavior by panic can endanger swimmers' attempts to rescue the victim. The suppression of rational thoughts. I, I fully believe those that are lost, until they see that they are lost, they're going to fight you tooth and nail. And it's scary because of the urgency behind it. There's going to be people that refuse to hear. And we went and we read to, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, go to Luke chapter 5. Let's open up in Luke chapter 5. We started in verse number 29, and we're going to read that again. 29 through 32. Luke chapter 5, verse 29 says, And Levi made a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with him. But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat with drunk, or drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered unto them and said, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And we talked about how arrogant is the statement that these Scribes and Pharisees say to Jesus Christ, why are you eating with sinners? And Jesus looks them straight in the face and he says, well, those that are sick are the ones that go see a doctor, not those that are well. And those that are sick up here that don't know that they're lost, they're not the ones going to seek out. Now, the great thing about evangelism is there are those that recognize they are sick. And we would consider those to be a good contact, right? That's a good contact. That's one that we should go after and grab a hold of and show them the truth. Folks, that one that's striving against, the one that doesn't know that they're sick, they're also a good contact. This world is lost and dying and they don't even know it. 
And so our call to action is not to go pick and choose the good ones, go find that one contact that's good. Our job is to, as the parable of the sower, to do what? So. That's what we're commanded to do. The sower went forth to sow, and he did. I love that, that uh, parable because the sowers never rebuked for taking the good message and throwing it on the roadside or throwing it into the rocks or throwing it into the weeds. He's not even criticized for throwing it into the good soil. He's praised and recognized for his efforts to sow the seed. You know, Romans tells us, Paul tells us that, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, but God's the one that gives the increase. Our job is to plant. And the admonition of, of Rob Whitaker is plant, don't pick. And so when we say or use terminology, this is a good contact, I think you and I can understand that this would be a, an, a, a simpler contact, one maybe that would start a little faster, one that would maybe move quicker towards the gospel, but that doesn't make it one good and one bad. Okay, that means one's going to take a little bit more time. One's going to need to mull over a little bit more. But our job is to plant, not pick. Jesus tells them here in Luke chapter 5, he, he tells them without telling them, y'all are sick. Y'all don't even know. You think that you're so righteous. You think you're in the right place, but you're not. It's interesting when you, when you look at this, um, just how blind these scribes and Pharisees are. We're going to read another account in Luke chapter 19 later, and we'll see the same, the same thing. The same thing. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed, seared with a hot iron. Y'all, sometimes we've got to get out of chisel. We've got to do a little work. That conscience is seared, meaning they have laid it to rest. They have put it off to the side. This is how it is. Sometimes it's going to take a little bit of work. And I think that's where we got into the conversation last week about the account in Matthew. Let's see. I'm sorry, with the limited commission, yes, in, in Matthew chapter 10. And we talked about, you know, what does it mean when Jesus tells his apostles to shake the dust off your feet? And we had some comments made towards the end of class and how, you know, perhaps this idea of just giving up on somebody whole out and marking them as forevermore, this person's lost. You know, that's not what we're called to do. I think the, the call to action coming from uh, Matthew there in chapter 10 it was for specifically for the apostles. Go, do your business, and if you're rejected, move on. You've got a limited commission. There's only a little bit of work to do. And as I went and read some the, uh, earlier uh, in Matthew chapter 28, where you have the great commission, what does it say? Go ye therefore unto all the earth. That's the limited, or that's the full commission. And what part of Matthew 28, when you read it, does it say, those that reject you shake the dust off your feet and mark them as heathens? We don't read that. I think the, the point, it says in Matthew chapter 28, I don't want to misquote scripture, so we're going to read verses 18 uh, and down forward. It says, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There's no part in the Great Commission, as we've called it, to say, shake the dust off your feet and mark the heathen and move on. Now, the idea that Jesus is giving his apostles to go out on the limited commission is if they refuse to accept you, move on. But if you go and you read the account 
of the great wedding feast, the great feast that was prepared. And the homeowner prepares this giant feast and he says, go and call all of my friends to come and eat with me. And how do his friends reply? Well, I'm, I'm busy. I, I've got married. Uh, I bought some land. And so his uh, servants come back and they say, man, they, they wouldn't come. They're not going to come. So what does the, the host say to do next then? We'll go to the highways and go to the undesirables, if you will. Go to them and see if they'll come to my feast. Go and gather up anybody willing to come to this feast. The limited commission was reserved for the Jews, the lost house of Israel. The great commission is those that rejected the Lord, the highways and the byways those that were lame, those that were uh, the non-desirables, if you will. The Great Commission includes those. So we have an obligation to go and to teach, to go and sow seed. It's not to pick and choose. It's not to uh, mark and cast off forever. My admonition to you with regard to the Great Commission is don't grind your wheels and get discouraged. I think that was the point I was trying to bring out, is don't grind your wheels and become discouraged in yourself because so-and-so hasn't accepted the word. I think the, the purpose of us going out into the world and seeking out, casting seed all over, whether it's the road, the wayside, the stones, the weeds, is because something's going to stick. And so if we sit there on the roadside and just keep throwing the same seed on the roadside all day long and we forget about our other obligations, we will miss out on opportunities. And I think that was, that's the point that I was trying to make last week, not to say that we are to cast out or, or mark someone as this is not a good contact or nobody, no Christian ever come back to here. You realize this is the, that was the instruction given to the apostles. It was to mark this city as non-receptive. It was an indication to the rest of the Christians that this city is not appropriate or not good. Our Great Commission doesn't include anything about marking those. Our Great Commission says go and sow seed. Before I forget, anybody got any thoughts or comments on that? Miss Laura. It does. It's, it's a challenging question indeed. How do you prep the soil before we go and, and meet a stranger? How do you cultivate a relationship with a stranger? And I think that's where we need to have faith and pray. You know, us as a congregation, this congregation of Wood Avenue in Florence, Alabama, you know, what can we do to cultivate our community? Well, we need to let our light shine for one. You're known in the area. They know our works. The Bible says they'll know you're Christians by your love. They'll know your Christ's disciples. There's something different about a Christian. And as far as pre-working and, and doing those things, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I, I think we'd, I'd be a lot more successful as an evangelist if I, <laughs> if I had the, the perfect recipe. But, you know, sometimes we just, we just need to do it. We just need to go and throw it out there, you know, and, and bring Christ. The one thing that we have to study later is that is where the power is. The power is not in me. It's not in you. It's not in, you know, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. The power is not there. The power is in the gospel. It's in there. We just have to go and open it up and show it. I think that's the big thing. And As far as, uh, you know, if we're an unloving congregation, if we're a congregation that's, that's conceited in our own, we're righteous and everybody else is not, and we live that 
that life of a, a scribe and a Pharisee where they're the best, they're the prime, I think that's, uh, that's the first way to, to lose a contact and to lose that opportunity. So um, maybe as we go through this study, we'll come up with some more and more and more. All right, let's get David first. I'm going to reiterate a little bit of what I said last week. As far as that, you know, I, I don't think that that limited commission as far as with you know, going a few apartments, say, you're right. I don't think it's really pleasant. But on the other hand, I do think that there is some, some stuff that about being efficient with our time in the sense that you've got to, you know, if, if somebody's not willing to listen to the gospel right now, don't keep trying to beat it into them. You know, go find somebody else who will listen and take it back. And, and who knows, maybe eventually that person will be receptive, but the, the time may not be right now. And that's why I'm sitting there trying to continuously turn to the other. Boy, what I'm saying is, you know, we've got to kind of take that. I think the, the big thing about uh, specifically David brought up, you know, there is there will come a time when you're when you're working on somebody and you're just grinding your gears, you're spinning your wheels, you're beating a dead horse, you're not getting anywhere, and you've dedicated all of your time and effort towards this one thing. If you're doing that, you're missing other opportunities. You are, we've only got so many hours in the day, so many days in the year, so many years left in our life and there's too much work to be done for us to get stuck in one pet project if you will one non-receptive person that has no interest and they'll spite you all the time there's no we don't have enough time to do that it's not our job to cast someone off and say this person is not a good candidate for the gospel it is our job to go sow seed it is our job to work with people i think the the main difference that i read today about the limited commission had to do with the fact that the apostles were told to mark that home, mark that city. They were marking people and saying, this city is full of Jews that don't want the truth. And this was a mark. This was like a big deal. Casting this, this assignment to them, assigning them a label. And we're not told to do that at all. We're told to go sow seed and seek out the lost. Miss Paula value of prayer as a partner to the actions like we're really good at one but not necessarily the other um, and so I think it's very imperative that we pray before we go pray when you come back you know continually continually pray about those contacts that you make with people even if you're just talking to somebody in line at the store um, I just think it's a valuable thing to do to partner to prayer with the actions of the contacts Absolutely. I, and if you couldn't hear Miss Paula, she said, uh, you know, we need to partner our actions with prayer before and after and uh, not lose sight of how significant, important and helpful prayer can be. Um, you know, us getting together tonight and starting our Bible class with the prayer is encouraging to me, gives, calms my nerves down. Um, us, when we meet together on the 5th, Lord willing, we meet together on the 5th. We're going to start with a prayer before food, and we're going to start with a prayer before we go out. And when we all get back safe and sound, uh, sometimes we disperse rather quickly, but we should meet together and have like a debriefing and offer a prayer there at our debriefing. So a lot of, a lot of this needs to be engaging our Father in everything that we do. 
whether it's door knocking, whether it's visiting, we need to engage our Father, ask for help, ask for wisdom, ask for strength. You look at what the apostles were told to bring with them, literally nothing. Go and, and do. And we're not going to be, uh, you know, they are blessed in, in, in ways, and we are blessed in ways. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring a good pair of shoes myself. Miss Kathy. I, and that's exactly, I'm glad you said that. That, is, that was the intent of the structure of our class, fix you before you go fix the world. And I'm, I'm proud of that organization structure of this class, fix me before I try and fix somebody else. Doesn't the Bible say something about a moat and a stick and a rock and I don't know, about it, your own eye? Fix yourself before you fix the world. And I think that's important. We need to structure ourselves, have our own faith grounded uh, in truth. So we talked about if you, if you love something, you'll look for it if you've lost it. We talked about souls being uh, walking around not knowing that they are lost. And then, of course, you know, naturally we have arrived at there's souls meeting their end every single day, minute, hour, second. And that's really what we need to keep in mind. Matthew chapter 7, if you want to turn there. Did I, was there any other hands? I didn't, I'm telling y'all, I get, I get rolling and I forget to ask. I suppose I'm supposed to say at, uh, in about seven minutes, you can go and get your children. I'm going to continue until the bell rings. Matthew chapter seven and verse 13 and 14 passages you're all very well familiar with. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and there are few, and few there be that find it. Y'all are familiar with this passage, broad and wide, that leads unto destruction. I was trying to con contemplate as I wrote this out, the sheer volume that a wide and broad gate can handle. You know, I heard a rumor that they're going to take... Um, one of the highways down, uh, it's Wilson Dam Road. They're going to take that road and they want to make it bigger. They want to make it wider, three lanes the whole way. And why do they widen out roads like that? Why was there a conversation about I-20 getting completely, I'm not sorry, not I-20, um, I-65 becoming uh, wider the whole way down from, from Alabama State Line, Tennessee to Alabama ending at the, down in, in the south? It's, it's volume. It's pure volume. We make things bigger and wider to handle more volume. So why does God describe the gate that leads to destruction as wide and, and broad? It's sheer volume. And he says the, the record number of people coming through this gate over and over again, day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, second after second, people meeting their fate. And then he describes the, the narrow gate I remember when I was a child, I read straight as S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty easy. You know, it's a straight gate. Ain't no crooked gate. Ain't a sideways gate. And it's not the G-H-T version. This is the straight 
as in a narrow passageway. And I, I went and I remembered, you know, in 2001, y'all remember the Suez Canal got blocked because a gigantic container ship got in there, hit the side and got cockeyed. It took them six days to push this container ship out of there. Interrupted interstate commerce like crazy. Interrupted the flow of goods through the Suez Canal. 2001, great massive ship. It is a narrow passageway hung up on the one side and got cocked sideways and wedged in there. It took six tugboats yanking on the thing for six days to get it pushed out. When you think about the, the two paths that Christ describes here in Matthew chapter 7, narrow and straight. And then he, he concludes it. If you didn't know what a narrow and straight gate's capacity is, he says it. Few there be that find it. The sheer volume of a broad and wide gate will handle should give us enough to want to go and recognize or go and, and try and evangelize to some capacity. The sheer volume of it. I want to turn to Luke chapter 19 and look at this. This is the account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem as he approaches the end of his time on earth. In verse number 28 is where the triumphant the triumphant entry begins. It was prophesied in, in uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verse number 9, that Christ would come and ride on a donkey and he'd be brought into town. They would lay the palm trees down and, and uh, he would have this great entry into the city. And I want to go forward after he's received, you know, he foretells his folks, go and find the donkey and a man's going to question you about it. Tell him it's for the Lord and he's going to let you have it. Go forward, it says in verse number 35, they brought him to Jesus being the donkey and they cast their garments upon the colt and they set Jesus thereon and he went and they spread their clothes in the way and when he was nigh to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen. In verse 38, he says, they said, blessed be the king that cometh from in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory to the highest. They're shouting and singing praises. They're laying the palms down as Christ comes through. They've called this the triumphant entry of Christ. And look at what happens in verse 39. Some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, speaking to Jesus, rebuke thy disciples. This was, this was curious to me. Why? Why? They called him Master. The Pharisees called him Master. They showed some kind of reverence towards Christ. Why, why would they tell his disciples to to stop shouting these, these praises, uh, calling him the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Why would they do that? It's because they don't know that they're lost. They don't know how wrong they are. And you can see Jesus' response to them, and he says, I tell you that should these hold their peace, even the stones would cry out. And when he was near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. And why did Jesus weep over this city? Why is it this city that just welcomed him, this crowd of people welcomed him? Why would he turn around to the city and look? I, I'm telling you, I think it's because the response in verse 39. He looks at these people and then he goes on here in verse number 42 and he continues, If you knew at least uh, in this thy day, that the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in it on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Specifically, Christ is referencing the destruction of Jerusalem but I also believe fully that he is lamenting those non-believers that tried to rebuke the disciples for singing praises to God. There are going to be an unknown number that go through that broad gate, an unfathomable volume of people to go through that big gate. And it was enough to bring Jesus to tears as he looked over this city after they had just welcomed him some of them welcomed him in this triumphant entry on the colt. They, they laid palm leaves down before him. He knew this prophecy was coming. They, they praised him, and yet he's got the naysayer standing there behind him, chewing on him. 
disciples shouldn't say such things. They're saying you're the Lord. They're saying you're from God. I can't help but think that there is a parallel here between the physical destruction of Jerusalem and the loss of life of unprepared people. I can't help but feel that weight as Jesus says there as he turns and he cries over the city. Consider, if you would, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. I'm going to try to do justice to this and not just speed through everything. You understand or have read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus from Luke chapter 16, starting in verse number 19. Jesus tells them an account. Now, whether or not this is a real life account or this is a parable, we won't get into that discussion tonight. But I want you to consider the words that the rich man says to Abraham here. In verse number 23, and it says, And in hell he lifts up his eyes, being in torment, and he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides this, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. I have five brethren, and if he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Something precious to you once it's gone. This man in torment is begging for just the drip of water off the tip of the finger of Lazarus. Come and cool my torment. And it was so important that he would reach out and speak to Abraham and say, please send him back. That way my family won't come here. The urgency behind evangelism is so large. This man from a place of torment called and begged for something to be done that his siblings, his five brothers, wouldn't have to deal with this. Unfortunately, when we meet our end or the Lord returns, it is too late. It is too late. The urgency behind evangelism is right now. Right now. The broad and wide gate is being filled immensely. The straight and narrow that leads to life everlasting is the goal. we got to fix us first. Let's get us through that narrow gate. It's funny, you know, I, I, we would sit at the table with the kids when they were younger and we'd say, you know, what's our, what's our number one goal? And we all know, number one goal is to get to heaven. What's our number two goal? Take as many with us as we can. That's our goal. Number one and number two, those are our goals. Fix yourself. I want to be a Christian. I want to be faithful to God, and I want to go through that straight and narrow gate. And my number two is to evangelize, evangelize. Pick as many people up as can go with me. The rich man and Lazarus speaks to us because it was too late for the rich man. It was too late, and he begs, please send Lazarus back. Don't let them. Don't let them. And Abraham says, no, it's too late. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 through 23 tells us, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, and let's, oh man, I've done lost it. Matthew 7 and verse 21, let's just read it. The Bible's a good Resource for us. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 27 says, And many will say in that day, broad and wide. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. When we talk about casting seed, to win souls. There are going to be some that will fight against you and say, I don't need anything you got. I've got the Lord. And they'll fight against you in a survival mode and they'll spot, in spite of you, they will attack you for doing this. They'll say, Lord, Lord, in the end. And they'll be professed to. But that one that you try with and you grind with and you say, We're gonna, I'm going to keep on this person. And they come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome into the joy of thy Lord. Those are the words that we want to hear. Second Peter chapter 3 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is not slack concerning that promise. He said, if you do the work, I will give the increase. It's his will that faithful people come to him or that people come to him and become faithful Christians. That is the Lord's will. And ultimately, if we don't do our part, if we don't do that urgency uh, steps towards evangelism, well, there are going to be a lot of souls. How many souls could you affect? You know, tonight we've, we've probably got 55 people in here. I realize that we're all not going to save maybe one person this year each, but man, that'd be awesome, 55 new people. And then next year we're at 110, and then the next year we're at 220. And the next year we're at 440 at compounds and compounds. And that'd be great to add one. Ricky mentioned it Sunday about how, you know, Wood Avenue has had multiple baptisms over the last year, two years. We got to keep this going, keep that fire alive because broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And people are going there not even knowing what's coming. Our job is to get out and make sure that they know. I wanted to read Psalms 125, and it basically says, The farmer who works hard gets the reap the reward at the end of the season. Folks, we have a lot of work to do. It's going to be challenging, it's going to be hard. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. You study with someone and they come, their eyes open as we're going to see. You can feel greatly encouraged watching somebody's eyes will open up. That individual that puts on Christ in baptism becomes a member of the Lord's body. Their soul is going to be in heaven and that's worth it all. Thank you all for your attention tonight.